Welcome to Electron Line, and the next topic in our videos is going to be nomenclature fundamentals. How do we name all the various compounds and ions and so forth in chemistry? And of course, that's a huge task. That could take many, many weeks, many, many months if you want to get it all correct. But I want to give you some basic understanding, and so we, I've produced a number of videos that will help you figure this out step by step. And so the first one, we're going to look at some ionic compounds. Ionic compounds are compounds that are created by exchanging electrons such that the elements that are doing the exchange and become ions and then they become electrically attracted to one another. And the reason why they want to exchange the electrons is because they then will go to a lower energy state and so then energy will be given off and any any time there's any sort of chemical reaction, an exchange of electrons can be considered a chemical reaction, and the end result is a lower energy state, there is the, the automatic um, force there to make that happen. That will happen because the result is that energy is released and you're now in a lower, more stable energy state. So again, what are ions? Ions, of course, they're either cations or anions. Cations are positive ions because they donate one or more electrons. Anions are negative um, ions because they receive one or more electrons, so therefore they become negatively charged. And so typically then a cation, cation will bond with an anion because of the electrical attraction. And when we name those bond, those things that are bonded together like that, they, uh, we use the first name, is the regular name of that particular ion, or the way it was as it was an atom. For example, sodium, which is now a sodium ion, is still called sodium. And then the second ion, which is an anion, we're just going to take the first part of the normal name and add I to it at the end. So chlorine becomes chloride, and so this becomes sodium chloride, and when we write that together as a single molecule, so this becomes NaCl, and single molecule named as sodium chloride. Now, before we try to name all these various ionic compounds here, let's talk about the ions. Notice here that in the first column of the periodic table, all these elements except for hydrogen, because hydrogen can either gain or lose an electron, uh, but all the other ones below hydrogen have the tendency when they become ionized to give off one electron. And that makes a lot of sense because all these have one extra electron in the outermost energy level and they're more than happy to give that electron away because the, the molecule or the atom doesn't hold on very strongly. So if something comes along that has a very strong need and a very strong pull of electrons, they'll simply will strip the electron off. And we're talking about usually the elements that are over here, the non-metals to the right, tend to be very uh, strong attractors of electron and they tend to rip the electron off of these elements right here. The second column, the same thing happens, but there we have two electrons in the outermost uh, energy level. And so both those electrons, if these become ionized, they tend to give both of those two electrons away so they'll become ionized as uh, cations with a plus two charge. There's a few more over here in the, in the metallic region of the periodic table that only have a very specific way in which uh, electrons are being removed. In the case of aluminum, Aluminum only exists as an atom or as an ion with three electrons removed. Zinc only exists as an atom or as an ion with two electrons removed. And silver, AG stands for argentum, which is the Latin name for silver. And that's why in French the name for money or the word for money is argent, which comes from the word silver because they used to make money out of the silver pieces. And so when it becomes ionized, it tends to give away one electron becomes a plus one charge. And so over here, the anions uh, come here from these elements when they attract electrons. So nitrogen tends to attract uh, three electrons, and so that becomes minus three charge when they become ions. So this is minus three. Oxygen and sulfur tend to attract two electrons, so become negatively two charged. And fluorine, chlorine, and bromine, they tend to attract one electron and therefore become minus one charge when they turn into ions or anions. So, what do we call these compounds then? So typically all of these will typically react with these to form compounds. And so here we have lithium, <coughs> which is over here, which will become positive one charge, and oxygen, which will become negatively two charge. So to get that electrically balanced, you'll need two lithiums, each positive one charge, with one oxygen, which is negative two charge, to form a solid 
uh, ionic bond, and so we call this lithium dioxide. Oh, no, lithium oxide. Sorry, there's no two oxygen. So this is called lithium oxide. Instead of calling it lithium oxygen, we call it lithium ox, and then we add I to it at the end. Here we have sodium chloride, so we have sodium, and instead of chlorine, we call it chloride. Here we have magnesium and sulfur. Magnesium becomes positive two charge, sulfur becomes negatively two charge, so that's why they attract each other perfectly in a one to one ratio. This becomes magnesium, and instead of sulfur, we write sulfide. Here we have potassium and fluorine, so this becomes potassium, fluor, and instead of in, we write fluoride. We have potassium and sulfur, so this becomes potassium sulfide. Here we have, uh, oh, that's, I'm missing an L. There we go. I was going to say, is that silver or aluminum? So we have aluminum oxide, and so you can really see the pattern here. Here we have zinc chloride. So now you say, well, how do we know that these have three oxygens or two chlorides or one sulfur or one fluorine? How do we know those? Well, there's no choice. Since they only become ionized in one particular way, we know that these can only form compounds in one particular way. So we don't have a multitude of names to describe the various sort of combinations that could exist because there's only one combination in each kind of bond between the cations and ions, anions of the ones that we have indicated there. So this becomes zinc chloride. And here we have calcium. So that's nitrogen, but instead of writing nitrogen, we write nitride. So this is calcium tride. So this is calcium sulfide or potassium sulfide. Sulfide. The next we have rubidium and oxygen. So this becomes rubidium oxide. So this is strontium. And here we have chlorine. So that becomes chloride. And here we have cesium and sulfur. So this becomes cesium and that becomes sulfide. And here we have barium and nitrogen. So this becomes barium nitride. And here we have cadmium and, and sulfur. So this becomes cadmium and sulfide. And finally we have silver and oxygen, so they become silver oxide. So there you have the way we name these simple ionic compounds, the ones where there's only one option in how they will become ionized, and when they then combine, there's only one way in which they can combine, so we don't have to worry about if there's two or three or one of each. Here we simply know this is lithium oxide, sodium chloride, magnesium sulfide, potassium fluoride, uh, potassium sulfide, aluminum oxide, zinc chloride, Calcium, nitrite, potassium, sulfide, rubidium, oxide, strontium, chloride, cesium, sulfide, barium, nitrite, cadmium, sulfide, and silver oxide. So all you have to do here is realize where they came from and how they can ionize. And there's only one way for those. So that's a good start that gives you a nice inroad on how to name ionic compounds. But of course, there's many more options and many more combinations, and we'll look at the rest in the next video. So if you're interested in this, stay tuned. We have quite a few of these videos set up to explain how to name these very compounds.